why don't we pray and then I'm going to just give a kind of a little brief recap of what we talked about yesterday because um, we're kind of continuing on and then we'll and then we'll keep going. So let's pray together. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that you know us and that you know us better than anybody else and you know us better than you know ourselves. And so we pray that you would give us exactly what we need. You know better than we do where we are hurt, where we are hiding, where we are exhausted, where we dream for meaningful relationships. Um, You know where we put our walls up the highest with other people. And you know exactly how to bring them down gently. We pray that you would let our time in here be... um, be helpful for us today, be meaningful, Uh, let this be clear and helpful and relevant um, because the gospel is always relevant uh, to wherever we are. And we pray these things, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. Alright, so um, yesterday uh, we probably, I hope, I hope you walked out of this room with at least one little mental image in your mind, a little, a little picture, illustration, something I drew up on the board. What was it? Magnets. Two magnets, exactly. And what was one of those magnets? What did it stand for? Relationships? Yes, good. The relational part of us, the kind of drive, the desire to have relationships and community and intimacy with people, to be known by other people, and to let other people know us. Um, that's that one magnet. And, uh, and we said that magnet, the, you know, the North Pole of that magnet is, you know, is, as, is, has a three block um, circumference. It's huge. It is a powerful force. Why is it there? Who put that magnet there and why is it there? Huh? God put it there. God put it there? Why is it there? He's relational. He's the perfect relationship. Yes. Yes, exactly. Because He is the blueprint that we were made off of. Remember that? We said we're the only people, we're the only things in creation who are made in the image of a three and not a one. And that means that our desire and drive to be relational and to have other people involved in our lives, that's something that's just built into us. It's hardwired. We can't get up in the morning and switch it off. It's, it's there. Um, you are the most beautiful, the most beautifully built relationship machine that the that creation has ever seen. You're not just a Ford Focus uh, relationship machine. I'm sorry if you drive a Ford Focus. I drive a Honda Accord, but you are a Lamborghini relationship machine. You are you have more potential, more power because of what because of how you're made and what you're designed for than you can imagine. You really do. But then we talked about this other magnet that's facing the opposite direction and always pushing back against how we're built and what we're designed for and what was what do we say that was? Sinful nature. nature. What else? Elaborate. It has something to do with Genesis 3. Remember? Desire to hide. Yes, yes, exactly. Our, our desire to hide because of something called the fall, because of something called sin that came crashing into our, into our worlds with Adam and Eve, and we try to sow fig leaves for each other, I mean for ourselves, not for each other, for ourselves, and we try to hide the, the guilt and the shame that we're not only born with in this world, but that we from things that we do every day. Things that, we're, that we hate about ourselves, that we're embarrassed of. We, we try our best to put up walls around ourselves so we can protect ourselves and hide from each other and from God. And we said that we still don't, we obviously don't still sow fig leaves for, each, you know, for ourselves, but we've gotten more elaborate and more advanced in the ways that we hide from each other. And we said that the gospel 
was the only thing that can really come in and change that. Because God, God sees the way that we hide ourselves. He sees our fear of being exposed. And He comes and He covers us in a way that we can't cover ourselves. Because eventually, remember we said, those fig leaves are going to dry up and shrivel up and leave you naked and ashamed and exposed. And what are you going to do? And so God is the only one, we said, that could actually cover us and that could actually allow us to... um, He's the one that takes that shame and that guilt away, allowing us to have meaningful relationships with each other. What we're going to do now today, though, is talk about how exactly does that brokenness, that relational brokenness, what does it really look like in our lives? Because I know it can sound very kind of heady and conceptual and kind of way up there when we talk about, okay, we're relationship machines, we're made for relationships, but we're broken and we need fixing. That, that, sounds, that can sound kind of abstract. What I'm going to do now is pull it down, hopefully, into, the, into, the, into our lives and talk about what does it look like in our relationships to be broken relationship machines? What does it look like? Um, so I'm going to give you another image, uh, another picture to remember uh, for today. And it looks like this. Anybody tell me, can anybody tell me what they think that is? Huh? Yes. Bingo. Those are not shark fins, those are waves. And, and uh, this is where we are. X marks the spot. This is where we are. Jerusalem dorm. Uh, I should stop recording so that no one would ever hear well, how I really think about Jerusalem dorm is, is way down here. Is anybody else staying in Jerusalem dorm? Yeah. See, you, you know what I'm talking about. Um, it's down here. Uh, this is where we are. That's that, there's a pool over there. There's this big pool over here. That's the uh, basketball courts. And this thing right here, this is the road. And I'm not sure what road this, what that road is called. Anybody know what that's called? Front Beach Beach Road? Okay. That's Front Beach Road. And Front Beach Road runs um, east and west, right? If we're looking at the ocean that way, that means that that is south, that's north, and which way is that? West? I'll trust you. (laughs) Now I'm confused. North. So this is east, you're saying? Good. I was right last hour. East, west. This road, let's just pretend, this road runs as far as you want it to west and as far as you want it to east, okay? Um, And I've got news for you. Just kind of let your imagination run wild. As of last night, we were attacked by a foreign country. This is now a war zone. And um, the Japanese came, attacked us last night. And now this road, we can still be on it, but we can't get off of it. Because they put barbed wire up uh, on each side. That's barbed wire. And it's running all the way down, and they planted booby traps all along the side that will blow you up. And they took away our sheriff with the gun. He's not there to protect us anymore or to shoot us when we don't cross the right way. Um, There are little machine gun turrets where little Japanese people are hiding to shoot us if we get off the road. And they're all along the road. We cannot get off that road. We can go as far as we want to west and as far as we want to east but we can't get off the road the problem with that is that 
I've got a group of guys in my, in my cabin and the only thing they want to do for some reason is to walk to the gas station that's a little bit down the road north. That's the gas station. And it's got a little revolving sign around it. Looks like a... I don't know. I don't know what it looks like. It's a gas station. Um, that gas station that was north, it's the only place you want to go, but you can't get there. Because if you take one step off the road, bam, you're done. You're not allowed to go anywhere off that road. You can go as far as you want to that way, as far as you want to that way. Does it help you? Is it any use to you at all that you can go 5,000 miles that way or 5,000 miles that way if you can't go a half a mile in the one direction that you really want to go? Does that help you? No, it doesn't. Because you can't, you can't get to the destination that you're trying to get to if you can only go east and west. Um, you and I, as broken relationship machines, as people with an incredible desire for relationships and community, um, we are on this road. We're on this road and we can't get off of it. Um, let me, let me, I'm going I'm to kind of flesh that out. Over here, the, this gas station, that's the one place we want to go. That gas station represents wholeness. It represents balance. It represents um, the kind of relationships that we're designed for. Um, it, rep it represents health. Um, but we can't go there. We can go as far as we want to in, in every other direction, but we cannot by ourselves get off the road. Now, what is that road? What, what road am I talking about here? Well, it's the road of being, it's the road of broken relationships. Um, and it's one, there's two extremes on this road, okay? Um, on the far end of one on the far end of, of one side, over here, way on the east, um, is one extreme that I'm calling um, isolation. Okay? So, isolation, iso, isolation. When you hear the word isolation, what do you think? Hmm? Exclusion. Exclusion. What else? Alone. Hmm? Alone. Alone. Loneliness. If you're isolated, you are by yourself, you're independent, you don't want or need other people, you have shut off everybody else, um, you're by yourself. You are a lone wolf, you are your own island, you're isolated. Um, that's the far end of, of this, of the spectrum over here. And guess what? As a broken relationship machine, you are free to go as far in that direction as your heart desires. You have the green light. You can go as far as you want to and explore everything that that side of the road has to offer. You can go. Or you can go in the other direction. What do you think would be on the complete opposite side of isolation? Any guesses? Being with, time. Being with people all the time? Yes? Okay, good. That's a good word. Huh? Community. community? You would think it would be community. You would think that community would be the opposite end of the spectrum from being isolated. But actually, we're talking about kind of the dark underbelly of community. And it's something called um, immersion. Now, when you hear the word immersion, what do you think? Baptism? <laughs> yeah. Immersion um, is, a, is a, a mode of baptism. You, you either sprinkle or dunk. When you immerse, 
When someone is immersed in baptism, they go all the way under the water, right? They're all the way under. Completely wet. All the way under. What else does it mean? What does it mean to be immersed? Hmm? Fully surrounded? Yeah. Yeah, good. If you're immersed, you are completely tied up and tangled around with whatever it is that you're immersed in. You're like someone who's been ducked under um, the swimming pool. You're completely wet. You're totally immersed. Now, what does that mean in relationships? What does an immersed relationship look like? It looks like having someone in your life that you literally can't do without. Someone who is so so important to you. Someone that your identity is so wrapped around and so tangled up with that if they so much as raise an eyebrow at you in frustration or in disappointment, it wrecks your world. Because to have their disapproval rock, rocks you to the, to the very bottom. Because what they think about you is the most important thing. If you're immersed in a relationship, um, your identity is completely determined by the other person. Um, you're so attached and so connected that, um, that, it's, that it's very, very unhealthy. Now, it's easiest to think about immersion when it comes in, in terms of like boyfriend girlfriend relationships. This is when, this is where it's easiest um, it's easiest to happen. Um, when you put a an insecure boy together with an insecure girl, and here's the nasty little secret: all of us are insecure. We're all insecure, which means that every boyfriend girlfriend relationship is a recipe for disaster <laughs> if God's grace doesn't come in. Um, we're all insecure, but what happens when insecure boy meets insecure girl? An insecure boy doesn't really know who he is, doesn't really know, um, he doesn't really know his place in life. But then here comes this beautiful, sweet little girl and shows him attention and, 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 and starts to give him things that he, and starts to give him a place in life. And he starts to feel like, I have found what I was made for, this relationship. And he starts to completely wrap his identity around this girl. Suddenly this girl is thinking, um, I'm holding this guy up. You know, can you, can you relate to that? You've either been there yourself or you have friends that are there. Um, where you, you can see that the level of attachment in this relationship is not healthy. It's not just that they really, really like each other. It's that if something happens to one of them, the other person, or if, if one person gets upset with the other one, the other person just like careens into depression and like self-hatred and everything and like cannot cope without having this other person in their life, you know? That's a very unhealthy end of the spectrum, way over here to the west on immersion. And, and it doesn't even have to be boyfriend-girlfriend. Um, this is where it's going to start to get kind of uncomfortable and it's going to stay uncomfortable for the next 25 minutes. Um, we can have friends in our lives. They don't, they can, they don't have to be boyfriend-girlfriend, but people that we are so dependent on that we wrap our identities around um, that we can't do without, we can't go anywhere without, we have to have their good opinion um, and they could be sitting next to you in this room, they could be here at RYM, they could be back home, but whoever they are they are your props for life, they are your crutch 
And if something happens to them, if something happens to that relationship, you're rocked to the very bottom. Um, they are they are what you they are what let they are what lets you cope with you know everything that this world brings. If you have them, you can get through. Uh, but if you don't have them, you're nothing and you're nobody. You have to have them. That sounds pretty unhealthy, doesn't it? Um, now, the fact is, as broken relationship people, you and I are free, 100% free, to move in either direction. We have this road all to ourselves and we can go as far down the isolation direction as we want to and as far down the immersion direction as we want to. And we're all doing it with everybody that we're connected with. You may not believe me, but, I th- but this is true. The people that you're closest to, you're somewhere on the spectrum with them. Unless the gospel comes in and changes us. Unless we're being changed by the gospel once and for all, and then every day of our lives, friends, we're going to be moving in one direction or the other with everybody that we know. We're either going to be moving towards being sort of self-protected, self-protective isolation, or towards being completely codependent and immersed and tangled up and unhealthy in this in this other relationship. Um, you know what the problem with that is? You know what's kind of at the root of that? Um, oh, you can already see where I'm, what I'm going to write because my eraser is pretty bad. Has anybody seen um, seen or heard the Brian Regan skit about the me monster? If you haven't, you need to. But the fact is, as broken relationship people, when sin came in and wrecked our blueprint, it turned us into me monsters. It turned us into people who are at the centers of our own little worlds. And... We're only concerned about ourselves. And we are the most important people that we ever meet throughout the day. Now, the, the, the problem is anywhere that you're on this road, in any direction that you're going, it's all about you. You, you, you. Me, me, me. It's all about me. It's all about m- my wants, my needs, taking care of myself, me feeling important, me feeling needed. And we're going to do whatever we can to protect me, to protect you. Now, you can probably, you can probably see how that's true over here on this end of the spectrum. Because when you're completely isolated from everybody, when you've thrown up all your walls and you're not letting anybody near you, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to see that you're just protecting yourself. You're only interested in you. You're only living your life for, for you. Um, when you don't let anybody within arm's length of you emotionally, um, you're, just, you're protecting yourself. And... Now we're going to get a little more uncomfortable. There's one relationship that you have, that probably all of you have, and it's either one or two people, and you probably see them every day, every 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 time you come home from school, when you either jump in the car with them or you come home and you lay your backpack down on the desk. And this person or these people are the, are interested in you. They ask you about your day. They want they want to be in your lives. They they want to they want to know what's going on. And you think that they are God's check and balance against your happiness in this life. 
you think that God put them there just to frustrate you. Um, yeah, you know who I'm talking about? Um, and you don't let your parents... You don't want to let them in. You don't want to, you don't want to let them into your world. You don't want to let them share any of your life or your experience. Um... You will only give them the tidbits of information that will make them happy enough to get off your back so that you can go to your room and keep on living your life and be in your world and you throw up all your walls against your parents. Um, and I want to be friends with y'all after this. I'm not, I'm not coming down on you. We're... We can still talk afterwards. Don't stab me in the back on the beach. We're, I'm not trying to come down and pound you here. We're all friends. I like like y'all and I love you. But our parents are the are the easiest people and probably probably the people in our in in your worlds that you isolate yourselves from the most. Um, there could be other people, other people that you're connected with, that God has connected you with, siblings, youth pastors. Uh, other leaders or friends that you just you give them the stiff arm don't let them anywhere near because it's all about you it would be risky for you if you let them in it would mean that you had to sacrifice things to let them in it's all about you you're the center of your world and you're going to stay that way down the isolation end. Now, certainly it wouldn't be like that over here on the immersion end, though, because if you're immersed with somebody, if you're completely codependent and um, wrapped around somebody, certainly it's not all about you. It's really all about them, right? You would think. But you're still on this road. You're still on the spectrum, which means it's, it's still all about you. The me monster is still alive and kicking here. And here's why. Here's why. Because the people in your life, whether it be a boyfriend or a girlfriend, or whether it be a peer, whoever it is that you can't live without, whoever it is that is that is that is that if you have their bad um, approval if they so much as raise an eyebrow at you, it wrecks your world. You can't do without them. You have to have them to cope with this world. You know what they are? They're just props. They're just crutches that are propping you up and helping you get through this world. And guess what? If they don't do it, you'll just move on to the next one. You'll just move from prop to prop and from crutch to crutch, doing whatever's necessary to cope with this, with with whatever this life brings you, struggles and trials, and it's all about you. You see, a, a, a needy boyfriend or a needy girlfriend. Here's the nasty little secret: they're not, they're not really interested in the other person. They're just trying to get by. Whew. Yeah, we're all getting kind of... That's uncomfortable. That's convicting. And I've spent all morning getting beat up by this myself, and so I've got to share some blows with y'all too. So, um, But that's, that's, pretty un, that's pretty uncomfortable. That the people, maybe the people in your life that you think that you're the closest to and that you're the most connected with, you're not really interested in them at all. You're just interested in protecting yourself and in getting by. And it's all about you. You are more selfish than you can possibly imagine if you're on this road. I am more selfish than I can possibly imagine. Um, there was a time in my life in college when this hit me uh, like it had never hit me before. I was having lunch with my RUF campus minister 
and my RUF campus minister was pretty good. <laughs> Your dad. <laughs> He was good at just at taking a scalpel out, at taking this little knife and carving away at the idols in my heart and peeling back, you know, areas of sin in my life that I couldn't even see. And we were having lunch one day, and I walked out of that lunch realizing that every relationship that I had in my life, every friendship that I had at that point in my life, I was the center. I was the sun, and everybody else was orbiting around me. My roommates. I was only interested in my roommates if they, could, if, if I, if they made me feel cool. I knew that I was a li- maybe I felt a little bit cooler than my roommates, and that's how I would relate to that's why I would get into their lives because they would they helped me feel better about myself. Incredibly selfish. There were other people in the in the RUF group, and you know some people with when people get cancer, some people get cancer on the outside, some people get cancer on the inside, and the people that have cancer on the inside, we all want to hang out with the people that have cancer on the outside because everybody can see their problems. Their problems are like screaming at everybody. And so we want to get around those people so we can feel better about ourselves because our problems are a little bit more easy to hide, a little more undetectable. And so I was getting around the people that had cancer like on their foreheads and on their nose, the people whose problems were easier to see. I was getting around them so that I could feel better about myself, so that I could feel like I had things together. Don't you see? Every relationship that I had was about me. I was the most important. They were all just props that were holding me up. And friends, you, you're there too. Who are the people in your life that you talk with regularly, that you spend time with, but that Maybe you don't, you don't care a lick about them. You could do without them if you had somebody else that would take their place. Because they don't really mean anything to you. The only thing that matters is what they give you. The only thing that matters is how they make you feel. Again. <laughs> I think... Alright, I like this. We can do this. Um... Okay, the lights turn out, and then people walk out. This is this is going to crush me because I'm immersed in this relationship. <laughs> and then Caleb's going to leave. Okay, we're done. Amen. Let's pray. No, I'm just joking. Um, where was I? What was I saying? No, seriously. Use people's props. Yes, 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 yes. I was right at the point where I'm where I'm stabbing you with a knife and you're thinking, why does he hate me? Um, Who are the people in your life that are just there to hold you up and that you may not you you may not really care about them at all? Um, I'm about to throw out kind of a complicated concept here but it's something that you can chew on. Anywhere that we are on this road, on this spectrum, anywhere that we are, we are denying our humanity. Hmm. Denying our humanity. Turning from human beings into non-human beings. That sounds science fiction. That sounds like the reverse of like Darwinian evolution, hasn't everything been moving you know, from non-human beings into human beings? And now you're saying we're, we're turning from human beings into non, back into non-human beings? What do you mean by denying humanity? Here's what I mean by that. You are a... You are made in the image of a three. Of a God who is a three in one. Yes! 
<laughs> I said something right. Um, and that's your blueprint. That's who you are. As a human being, um, you are made for relationships. That's, what, that's what's fundamental about being human. Now watch this. Down here at this end of the spectrum, if you're isolating yourself and you're saying, I don't need other human beings, I really don't need relationships, other people, I don't need them in order, in order to live this life, you're denying that you're a human being. You're saying, I'm really not what the Bible tells me that I am. You get that? You're denying your humanity. You're saying, I'm really not a human being. I'm not made in the image of God because I can get along without people. Down this end of the spectrum. So down this end of the spectrum, you're not a human being. Watch this. Down on this end of the spectrum, those relationships that you just can't live without, those relationships that prop you up and get you through life, guess what? You're the human being, all right, but those other people aren't. Those other people, you've turned them from human beings made in the image of God, you've turned them into crutches, into props. And you've put them down on the level of an Xbox. Because you can. some people can get along fine in life with an Xbox. That's just what they need to get by with. They're down there on the isolated end of the spectrum. But guess what? You've, you've turned that beautiful human being that you're in a relationship with, you've turned them into the, into the exact same thing. Because all they are is a prop to get you by. And you're denying their humanity. Um, you're just using them. You're using them as a tool to prop you up. And you're denying their humanity. So anywhere that you are on this spectrum, you're denying humanity. And you're, and you're turning away and rebelling against what we were made as. As human beings made in the image of God. Does that make sense? Um, and this, I, this hurts, I know, because we're all, we're all staring down the barrel of a gun here. None of us, none of us are innocent here. Let's pray. I'm, lunch. I'm just joking. It doesn't end like that. That's the good news of the gospel. Um, it does not end like that. Thank God. What does the gospel have to do with this? Well, here's the story of the gospel in five minutes, hopefully. Um, there was once a perfect human being who was the... He was your blueprint. He was the perfect relationship machine. Um... And this perfect human being was born, he lived for 33 years, and not for one second of his life did he ever travel this road, because he was not born on this road. He was born here, not, not at a gas station, but he was, <laughs> he was born healthy and whole, and not for one second of his life did he ever protectively isolate himself from, from other people or become needy and use other people? Not for one second. Jesus Christ was the perfect relationship machine and he came into this world, lived a perfect life as a relationship, as, as a relational human being, God himself. And he didn't go back up into heaven and say, nah, that's how you do it, you can't do it, go to hell. It's not how it worked. 
the gospel is this is that Jesus Christ, the perfect human being, the perfect relational human being, put himself on the cross and voluntarily got smashed by the wrecking ball that wrecked you and me. He didn't have to do it. He didn't earn it. It was unfair like Elbert was saying last night, he voluntarily stepped up on the cross and took the hit. He got broken for you and me so that he could heal you and me. Um, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, Something happened that had never before happened in the history of the universe. That perfect blueprint that we were talking about, that we're made in the image of, God took a giant pair of scissors and cut it up, it cut it through the middle. And the perfect relationship was torn in two. And God said, I'm not going to treat you like my son anymore. I'm going to treat you like a sinner like a rebel, like, like the dirty, filthy thing that you are. And he poured out his wrath on him, and that relationship was broken. And Jesus experienced the hell that you and I deserve. Jesus jumped onto this road for us so that he could, put, so that he could take us off the road so that He could give us the wholeness and the balance and the health that He is. Um, we're going to close with this. And you don't, don't, you don't have to turn there, but... Oh, you don't have to turn there, but this would be a fantastic verse to kind of uh, contemplate this week. It's Philippians chapter 2, and I want you to just listen carefully to this. It says, have this minds among yourselves. Paul's writing this and he says, this is how I want you to think. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. He says, this mind is, a, is now available to you. It can be yours. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He's saying Jesus, not for one second of his life, was a me monster. He was always about other people. And now Paul is saying, through the gospel, through Jesus' death, and, and resurrection on our behalf, that's available to you and to me. He says, have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus. That's a very fitting way to end. So let's pray together and then we'll go. Father in heaven, I pray that you would help us to believe this. Um, we believe. Help our unbelief. And show us where we need to grow and show us where we need to be fixed by the gospel. And let us love you more and trust you more. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, y'all.